Throughout Call of Duty's history, we've had many innovations that changed the game over, for better or for worse. Things like the shift from the standard 357 killstreak system to a selectable list of choices in Modern Warfare 2, including the fabled Tactical Nuke. As well, other things such as the shift from the straight killstreak system to the score streaks in Black Ops 2, a creative class system that offered much more customization and individual player choice of the Pick 10 system as compared to the old set in stone weapon attachment secondary three perks and equipment system. There is no shortage of things the franchise has done over the last decade to improve and build upon previous versions of the game. But how about those innovations that we saw once and then never again? The ones that seemingly may be lost to history forever. Whether integral parts of a gameplay system, a business practice, or a perk that was designed for tactical play in mind, but never once got carried out for its defined purpose, today we're going to look at 10 innovations in Call of Duty's history that were never seen again after their initial introduction. Starting off with number one on this list, let's start out with a personal favorite of mine, that being the Armory from Advanced Warfare. Now, the Armory was an introduction that really was meant to showcase a lot of the new customization features within Advanced Warfare. For those of you guys that do recall, Advanced Warfare had probably the most in-depth customization system of any Call of Duty to date. You could end up customizing things like your knee pads, your boots, your uniform, your exosuit, and so on and so forth. There was no shortage of customization items in that game, and subsequently the introduction of supply drops, that allowed for customization beyond imagination compared to what we had seen previously. And the armory was this location that housed all of this. You could see what variants, what customization item, whatever it may be, how many you had of them, and even if you wanted to get risky with it, have some wagers with your friends or somebody else in which you could actually delete these items if you so chose to. Now, while a lot of you guys may not have ever deleted your items, it was something if you chose to do that, you'd end up getting an XP bonus for burning that item essentially. But ultimately, the armory was an addition to the game that was meant to keep customization simple. You saw everything that you had on your account right there in front of you, and it was a cool way to visualize and actually go and check out everything that you had. Whereas now you have to go in and say, look at different variants they may have on different games by going to the weapons, scrolling across, and so on and so forth. Everything was listed right in front of you. Customization items like helmets, gloves, boots, all that kind of stuff for your operator, plus all your weapon variants and their designated rarities. It was an all-inclusive one-stop shop for you to be able to check out the items on your account. But after Advanced Warfare, we never saw that again. Number two on this list goes back to another Sledgehammer Games title, but a different game at that. This one, we're going to be talking about Call of Duty World War II and more specifically, the headquarters. Taking a page seemingly out of Destiny's book, the headquarters was supposed to be that communal area for gamers to all connect into one individual housing unit, essentially, and be able to interact with each other, be able to commend players as it was, watch supply drop openings, check out other players' luck, challenge people to firing range battles or 1v1s. You could even take part in some retro gaming from the Activision Games titles in the r, &R station. A little later on, the flat gun event was something that brought players together even further to complete one unified goal of being able to gain more armory credits and taking out the incoming bombers on the headquarters, but initially slated as a sort of release with the game that everybody would connect to the headquarters, that unfortunately caused some major instability with the Call of Duty servers, and thus the headquarters then later on became something you had to physically enter instead of just being automatically transported there anytime you connected to the online servers. But even while there were some bumps in the road early on, the headquarters turned out to be something that was honestly quite cool, introducing some something of a social score rank as well that allowed for a little bit more bragging rights, but you may also recognize it a little more by the guy doing jumping jacks by the headquarters ranking wall by Major Howard. It was an ambitious introduction into the Call of Duty franchise, but though it is still a little earlier on compared to other games that we may talk about here in this list, Black Ops 4 has no such thing as the headquarters and moving forward into information regarding future titles, well, we one, don't know, but two, doesn't seem like there's any whispers of that happening again. Next up, we're going to talk about a business practice that may have been born out of necessity because of the year that the franchise saw during the time, but the fact that Infinite Warfare allowed for DLC weapons to be granted for absolutely free to players with the Season Pass holders. Additionally, if you didn't have the Season Pass, this was something you didn't have to worry too much because each weapon had their own subsequent in-game challenge that really wasn't all that hard to complete. Just took a little bit of time to end up unlocking them, but you ended up having the ability to get the weapon either immediately or shortly thereafter it was released as compared to the year years previously that led up to this moment in which we saw, even in tandem alongside with Modern Warfare Remastered, weapons and collections that you had to spend a lot of time grinding out for or saving up a lot of keys to end up unlocking that collection.
collection in general. Black Ops 3 saw all DLC weapons thrown in supply drops and only becoming random chance, as well Advanced Warfare the year before that also threw their weapons and weapon variants within supply drops as well. So this being the first introduction to sort of DLC weaponry outside of the various few times whenever in say Ghost you could buy the Ripper for a small fee up front, that you actually were guaranteed these items by simply just playing the game and if you paid for the season pass, getting it immediately. Whatever your thoughts on Infinite Warfare's core gameplay was, loved it or hate it, I think we can all agree that was a great way to deal with weapon DLC in post-launch content. Next up, we're flashing back to Modern Warfare 3, another Infinity Ward title, and we're gonna be talking about weapon proficiencies. Now, these included at the time kick, range, attachments, focus, melee, stability, impact, speed, damage, and breath, with all of course having their own subsequent descriptions and their own weapons that they could end up being applied to. This feature tried to add a little more customization to the weapons and the create a class system that didn't utilize the pick 10 system, but would allow for a little bit more in terms of player individuality. Only one weapon proficiency could be used on a single weapon and was only available for the primary weapons. If you ended up having specialist bonus, you could end up getting a couple more of these added on whenever you got that bonus. But the interesting part also with this is that it was sort of a hybrid between attachments and perks, being only available for specific weapons, but also only being tethered to the player that used them. So if you had a specific weapon proficiency and you ended up getting killed, if somebody picked up the weapon that you had, they would not in turn get that proficiency tied with that creative class that you had. The only exception to that being the attachments proficiency, which actually affected the weapon itself in equipping two attachments to the same weapon. So it was an interesting little change up of the meta of how we played Modern Warfare 3. And to this day, we haven't seen anything such as the proficiencies again. While of course there are things like attachments and different variations of things we've seen that may mirror what proficiencies did in a sense, proficiencies themselves have not returned. Jumping back to another ambition that Sledgehammer Games had with Advanced Warfare, we're going to talk about next the Pick 13 Create a Class system. Now, this was interesting because we had seen previously the Pick 10 system in Black Ops 2, which proved to be a fan favorite. But a Pick 13, when announced at the official reveal of Advanced Warfare for multiplayer, we saw that this would account for absolutely everything. Previously, the Pick 10 system counted for your perks, attachments, and weapons, but the Pick 13 allowed you to manage your score streaks per se, even to reallocate your creative class slots to maybe more attachments or more perks or maybe vice versa. You wanted an absolute bare bones gameplay experience for your weaponry, but you wanted upwards of four score streak slots. You could do that. So pick 13 offered a little bit more variability in how you could create your class within Advanced Warfare. And whether you consider this an absolute hit or you didn't really like it all that much, it was something that kind of challenged the conventional pick 10 system that we had seen previously. But since then, we haven't seen the pick 13 return in any capacity. Next up, we're going to talk about one specific aspect of a really cool service that maybe met its untimely fate in 2014, that dealing with Call of Duty Elite. Now, Elite was a service that, again, tried to offer many, many things to players, but one interesting part that was rather unique to this and that we have yet to see since were exactly in the same case as what we saw with Elite was the way DLC was distributed during Modern Warfare 3's primary year. Now, DLC went exclusively through the Elite system, so therefore you had the ability to get things for free, or you could end up being a premium member in which you paid a little money, but you also got things earlier on. Elite drop content packs, some larger than others, including things such as multiplayer maps, spec ops missions, and later then, face-off maps as well. Now, there were still the exclusivity deals in place that allowed Xbox users at the time to get things a month earlier than PlayStation 4, but the interesting part with Elite's DLC system with Modern Warfare 3 was that inevitably, everybody got these maps for free. Free. It was around a 50 to 60 day period between the initial release on that platform from when it was exclusive to when players ended up getting it for free. So Xbox users got DLC one or content pack one first release of them and the exclusive rights to premium members on January 24th. But then it was later than available to all Xbox 360 players on March 20th. That's something that is a great way to handle DLC as it does not fragment player lobbies and the community that may have to pick and choose between playing matches where they may get kicked out if they don't have the DLC because everybody would eventually have it. While the Black Ops Pass looks to emulate a little bit of this in terms of the frequency of drops, it seems like we'll be getting new maps once every two months or so rather than in bulk 
like what we saw previously with DLC 1 through 4 in previous titles, where it fails to hit the mark on replicating what Modern Warfare 3 and Elite had, was not only one, the frequency in which it was a little faster, but also the fact that it was available to everybody eventually for free. Black Ops Pass holders are the only ones that can end up having it, and as it stands, there is no a la carte system in Black Ops 4 in which you can buy content drops individually. Next up, we'll talk about one of the most controversial items within Call of Duty's history, as is that being a perk that was meant to be innovative and reshape some of the meta of how multiplayer was played in Call of Duty, that being One Man Army from Modern Warfare 2. Now, initially, it might surprise you to hear about this, but it was intended for more tactical natured play, such as switching perks on the fly to avert, say, air support if somebody has something up in the air, or if you say, theoretically became the last alive in Search and Destroy, you could switch on the fly to a more stealthy class. But the perk was most fondly remembered probably for the use of the One Man Army Noob Tube, or refilling the grenade launcher ammo. Interestingly enough, there actually was a patch set for Modern Warfare 2 that would have removed the ability to replenish Noob Tube ammo, but the patch never saw the light of day amidst the crumbling Infinity Ward team at the peak of their lawsuit with Activision, as well as the publication fees that were wildly high back in the prime of Modern Warfare 2. So unfortunately, while it was something that was intended for completely different use, it got abused in a different way, and as such, we never saw One Man Army again, which is probably for the better. Next up came an interesting little introduction into the in-game playstyles and what could reward players for playing a little bit differently in Ghosts, that being Field Orders. Now, usually it was something that was the first kill rewarded this and then it sort of chained together on a big game of tag that you had no idea the player could end up having that Field Order, but if you killed them, you then got it. The Field Order was something that tasked players with individual challenges that, again, may have been a bit out of the ordinary, which probably one that you guys may all remember fondly was to humiliate another player after killing them, aka teabagging their dead body. Whatever the challenge may be, if you completed it, you ended up in most cases getting the ability to end up getting a care package that gave you some sort of streak, but in some map specific cases, it actually gave you a chem strike which completely redid the entire map in a sort of dynamic event. Some more so than others, strike zone being probably the one that most players knew because it completely shattered the entire map. While field orders may have been something that rewarded players you may not have thought deserved those streaks, it was an interesting little introduction that tried to reshape even just some of the smaller play and challenge players to do something they may not. And since Ghosts, we haven't seen anything like that that has challenged players to adjust their playstyle for a slight reward. The penultimate innovation here on this list goes back to Call of Duty World War II and a brand new introduction to the create a class system, that being the division system. Now, divisions were stepped down from the hero-based specialist that we had seen in previous years, but it also still tethered specific abilities and items to operators, if you will, that didn't allow for complete freeform customization of your create a class system, but did offer some built-in attributes. Now, upon the E3 reveal build of World War II, compared to launch, compared to when the game finished up, it was a much different system that changed well over a couple of times, with a massive division overhaul as it was dubbed, taking place just after the turn of the new year. That from start to finish, it evolved in its own right, but it was still something that challenged the, again, conventional outlook on create a class, and again, while still a little too early to tell if it will ever return, given community feedback, it may not, but it's still an innovation no less that we've only seen once in COD's history. And the final thing we'll talk about goes back to Modern Warfare 3 once again, in which it was just an innovation in a way that players could end up taking on one another in what was dubbed face-off. You had the ability to face off in 1v1, 2v2s, or 3v3s with your friends or random strangers in which you'd end up trying to play for that dub on smaller maps and even specific maps for face-off. Some I remember fondly and they were a ton of fun to play, but unfortunately, we haven't seen them reintroduced in Call of Duty in any capacity. While we have had Team Tac in which it replicates a 3v3 nature in multiple Call of Duties, face-off making it a little bit more personal with the 1v1 and 2v2s in a addition to that 3v3 game mode was something of a lot of fun that I'm sure if you played in the prime of Modern Warfare 3, you remember fondly. That said, that's we're going to wrap it up with the 10 innovations to Call of Duty that we have yet to see again return in any capacity. And that said, is there anything that in this list you maybe remember fondly and wish would come back? Is there anything I may have missed that you'd like to add to it? Whatever it is, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, but hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you drop a like down below. And of course, if you are new to the channel, make sure you guys subscribe so you don't miss a single thing regarding all things Call of Duty related, updates, news, information, tips, tricks, general look backs like these ones. If you're interested in it, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single thing. If you guys also want to follow me over on Twitter and Instagram, there's the best places to get connected with us on YouTube, but I can live on both those. If you guys want to strike up a conversation, ask me a question, whatever it may be, link is down there in the description below. But all that's said now out of the way, thank you guys all so much for watching. My name is Espresso. I'll see you guys later. Take care and peace.